uh, I was also here yesterday, so I hope you're not sick of uh, seeing me over and over. Uh, so today I'm actually going to talk uh, about the Sertor Approver. And, uh, uh, you know, I'm going to try to give you some examples of situations and scenarios where uh, using something like formal verification is uh, beneficial. And hopefully, by the end of the talk, I can convince you that you, know, it's, uh, you should go to the workshop and uh, check out how to use the tool. OK, so uh, just to, to tell you a little bit about uh, Sertra itself. So we do have a booth at the back, and we have some amazing people there. Uh, so we are a team of uh, formal verification people. Uh, a lot of us actually have studied this topic for, you know, uh, some people have studied it for decades. Some of us have studied it for you know uh, five or seven years at the very least, and uh, you know we uh, kind of came together to see how to apply these techniques to the DeFi domain. And we also have a very strong group of security researchers and security engineers who have a lot of expertise in, in DeFi and uh, have the you know the security mindset, and they are uh, doing the the actual work of. Uh, proving properties about your code if you are a DeFi engineer. So this is roughly the two kinds of groups that we have at Sertora. And yeah, feel free to ask us uh, any questions uh, if you have. OK, so uh, why are we uh, here? I think probably for this uh, uh, group here, you know, we, uh, we already know what DeFi is. Uh, so you know, DeFi is a domain where a lot of the uh, processes are determined by code. And uh, a lot of the times, the code is uh, quite complex, right? So uh, later in the, in the next slide, I'll actually tell you that the code is uh, perfectly fit for formal verification. That is true. Uh, but uh, if you are you know, working in the DeFi space, you'll know that a lot of the times, we write like, really complex mathematical expressions and things like that. So uh, it's actually important to get these uh, things correct. And uh, of course, you know, there's a lot of money invested in this. So DeFi is a place where having uh, strong guarantees about your code is worthwhile. Uh, these are just a couple of examples of uh, you know, big uh, vulnerability hacks that have happened in the past year. Uh, if that is not convincing enough, you can just go and look at more recent examples uh, on Rex. And these are all uh, you know, bad things. So we want to prevent these bad things from happening. So, then the question is, OK, so what can we do? And uh, I'm here to tell you that you can try to do formal verification on these uh, DeFi applications. So again, like I said, uh, DeFi is really interesting, actually, because uh, here, you know, the code is determining a lot of the things that are going to happen. So you know, it's, it's quite, in some ways, it's actually kind of uh, more reliable, right? Like you know, you have. You, there's a thing that you can look at and decide and figure out what's going to happen. And so the fact that code governs this is really interesting. Uh, there's a lot of money at stake, which is uh, uh, you know, one of the reasons why we care about this domain. Uh, and like, we care about the safety and uh, reliability of this domain. Uh, and one of the things that is interesting about DeFi from like a formal verification point of view is you know, if you have done formal verification in other domains, a lot of the times, we have to worry about things like, oh, how do we uh, you know, think about like, loops and you know, really large programs and like, all kinds of like, you know, complex interactions. Now, these things also do happen in DeFi. And this is actually one of the main challenges in applying uh, formal verification in DeFi. But it's actually much more manageable than other domains. So that's why it kind of makes it much more interesting uh, for formal verification people. Uh, another problem uh, in the DeFi space is the bugs are often really subtle. And uh, you know, it's really hard to sit down and think really carefully about tests and like, make sure that the tests are covering all the, like, the corner cases. So uh, you know, the, the finding bugs in this domain is really, uh, really hard. And so you know, it's something like verification could be beneficial here. And uh, the last thing is that you know, the code, like, things change really fast in this domain. right? So you, have, uh, you, know, you wrote something today, and then, then you know, in a couple months, like, the code is gone, and like, you have new versions of the code. And so there's this continuous process of you know, generating new code and then you know, make, like, the need to make sure that the code is correct before you deploy. So that's, these are some of the reasons why you know, formal verification is a good uh, technique to be used in, in this domain. And so uh, you know, we have seen a lot of talks in the past uh, day, and, day and a half already. And people have covered all sorts of different techniques. And these are all really great techniques, right? So uh, depending on what you're doing, you, know, you should pick the, the tool, the technique that is best suited for your needs. 
so here we have a few examples. So there's, uh, we have seen a lot of talks about testing and fuzzing. Uh, so here are some tools you know, that are really good at doing uh, fuzzing and testing and related uh, uh, things. And then we have uh, static analysis-based tools. So we have um, some of these tools are actually not necessarily used in the crypto space yet, but it, they could be. Uh, and some are, are like, you know, so, so Terra Prover, for example, it also does some static analyses. And, um, you know, it, uh, we basically try to do uh, an, like a sound over approximation of the behavior um, just to make sure that we are, uh, you know, like sound and not uh, giving you false uh, negatives. The other techniques are basically automated formal verification. This is also something that we do at Sertora. There are other tools uh, that do this. So there is uh, one very popular tool called Daphne. Uh, I don't think Daphne has been really used in the crypto space yet, but a lot of the stuff that we do at Sertora is actually inspired by some of the ideas that uh, are in, in the Daphne tool. Uh, there's also the CBMC, which is a bounded model checker for C that has been around for a really long time. So if you're interested in this domain in general, I think these are some really good tools that you can take, uh, check out. And finally, there is proof assistant based formal verification. So this is like the hardest way you can do uh, check that your program is correct, right? It's, it's, it's extremely challenging, but the guarantees you get from this are probably the strongest guarantees that you can get. So uh, there is uh, the K framework. So runtime verification has uh, you know, uh, techniques and tools that are uh, using this technique. And uh, there are also some other uh, very famous tools like the Cock Theorem Prover, the Lean Prover, and so on and so forth. Okay, so I, as, I, as I said, uh, each of these techniques have their own pros and cons. So if you are just starting, I think testing and fuzzing are really good uh, you know, t uh, techniques to use. Uh, they're very easy to get started. And uh, it's, uh, you know, it's easy to uh, work with these kinds of tools. The issue there is that it's actually sometimes hard to find bugs because, as I was saying earlier, uh, a lot of the times the bugs that we find in these DeFi applications are very subtle. And if you're fuzzing and testing, it might take a while for you to actually hit the right uh, input that exposes a bug. Um, static analysis has you know, its own pros and cons. So one of the things that is uh, often the, uh, the problem with static analysis is false positives and false negatives. Uh, so you almost certainly don't want to have a false negatives, which means that your tool shouldn't say that there is no bug when there is actually a bug. Um, the other side of that is a false positive, where the tool says there is a bug, but there actually isn't a bug. So you know, those, both of those things are, you know, we want to avoid them. But we definitely want to avoid false negatives because uh, that's, you know, it, it, it basically gives you false hope that your code is correct, but it's actually not correct. OK. And then we have uh, automated formal verification, like the one I'm going to talk about today about the search approver. Um, so one of the things about these tools is these tools are very good at finding really subtle bugs. And they're automated, right? So you have to write the property, as we're going to see. But once you have written the property, the, the proof itself is not, you don't have to sit down and do the proof, right? The tool will find a proof for you. Um, but the other, on the other side, these uh, formal verification tools that are automated, they're actually very computationally expensive, right? So they take uh, you know, lots of, sometimes they can take hours to run. Uh, it, it helps if you have you know, a cloud service uh, where you can run it so that you don't run this on your machine locally and stuff like that. Uh, but overall, you know, it's a good technique that uh, has a lot of benefits, but also is expensive. Uh, and then finally, the proof assistant based approach, as I was saying, you know, it's, it, it, is, uh, it, it gives you the strongest guarantees. Uh, it actually, these tools are also much more expressive, so you can write really complex properties in these, uh, in these tools. But the downside is that it is very laborious and it takes many, many months and maybe sometimes even years to prove uh, properties for real systems. OK, so we've seen kind of a, you know, two dimensions, right? So on one hand, we have the amount of security you get. That's the y-axis. And on the x-axis, we have the automation. And so uh, the, you know, basically, there are the static analysis and the fuzzing and all of these techniques kind of go on the extreme you know, x-axis, right? So they are highly automated, but the guarantees are not that strong. And then on the other hand, we have tools like uh, the theorem provers that are less automated, but they give you stronger guarantees. And uh, at Certora, what we are trying to do is have the best of both worlds. Now, you know, uh, I can't tell you if we are succeeding, so you should listen to the talk and tell me if you think that we are succeeding in being in this, the best of both worlds kind of scenario. Okay, 
So um, before I go into the details of how the prover works, so most of the talk will actually focus on the prover, I actually want to ask, uh, ask you this question to you, like why, why, do you think t why do we think tests aren't enough? And I think this is a very reasonable question, right? So if, if somebody is telling you that you should use this really complex thing, you should really ask, like, okay, why can't I use the simpler thing, which is obviously you know, easy to use and you know, uh, you know, much faster to, to run and so on. So here I'm going to give you an example of a, a, a real-world uh, protocol where you can write tests, but it's not easy to write the tests that will catch certain kinds of bugs. And for that, I'm going to take the example of the Aave governance uh, v3 protocol. So um, uh, the people, so we at Certra, we have actually been working uh, with Aave for uh, quite a while. And some of the things about Aave that we, you know are really amazing is that their code is already very high quality. So they are, uh, the team has exceptionally good engineers. They write really good code, and they have the right security mindset, right? So they take serious, they take the correctness of their programs very seriously, and so they use a lot of different techniques to make sure that they don't have bugs in their code before they deploy it. And Aave also actually uses Foundry to do testing. So this actually is the reason why I think this is an interesting example to look at. And so uh, here I'm going to give you a quick overview of uh, the governance uh, architecture. Uh, I'm not going to go into the details. The details actually are not super relevant for this talk. So just uh, you know to just to give you a quick overview of this, there's roughly three big modules in the Aave governance. So there is the governance module, which is basically a contract that lets you, um, so this, the, the governance contract lets people like, make proposals, right? So uh, if you want to make a proposal, uh, you, you know, the governance co contract has a bunch of functionality that you need to use. Uh, the governance um, um, contract also, uh, it enforces a bunch of different um, constraints, right? So sometimes maybe uh, there needs to be some time between when a proposal is made and when the voting can start. Or maybe there's also constraints about how long the voting can go. So these are all things that are done by the governance module, which is just a contract. And then there is the voting module, and the voting module is actually responsible for letting people vote. And we don't need to get into the details of how it works, but know that there is a module that lets the voting happen. OK, and then there is a the third module, which is the payload controller. So what the payload controller does is uh, say that you actually made a proposal, and the proposal won, right? So voting happened, the proposal was approved, it won, and now something has to be done. So some code has to be executed, and the payload controller is the module that is responsible for that. OK, and then we have this DI thing in the middle. So this is kind of a delivery infrastructure, which is not really uh, part of the, these three components. It's like a separate thing. And it's just basically a way for these different modules to talk to each other. OK, so uh, if you look in the Aave website, uh, you will also see that they have a very elaborate set of properties that they have written in plain English that actually say what the, the contract should do. So uh, a lot of this is actually not necessarily for verification, but there are properties that are uh, you know, things basically that you should test or verify. So here, uh, two that are uh, going to be of interest for us is uh, the property that says that once you are in a state greater than three, no more transactions, uh, state transitions can happen. So you cannot make any more transitions from that state. So that's a property that is of interest to us, and we'll see in just a second why. Another interesting property that you can check is that proposal state cannot decrease. So the state actually is an enum in Solidity. So it's like, a, I'll show you in, a, in just a second what it is. But the numbers basically tell you what state uh, you are in. OK. So what happened is that uh, one of my uh, colleagues, Gadi, he was working on this uh, protocol. And he actually found a violation uh, because he was basically looking at these properties. And he was uh, trying to figure out you know, if all these properties are satisfied by the implementation. And it turned out that there was a violation of one of these properties, which is that uh, no further state transitions are possible once you are in a state greater than three. So how did that happen? So uh, basically, what uh, you know, the way the code works is there are, like I was saying earlier, there is an enum called state, and there can be multiple different, you know, it has a bunch of different values. So it can be none, it can be created, it can be active, and so on and so forth. And the counting starts from zero. So if you, if you are uh, anywhere, um, I think I maybe got the order wrong. So it doesn't actually matter. But uh, if you are past the executed state, 
basically you can't do any more um, uh, transitions. And so the bot that Gadi found is quite interesting. So it turns out that in the original implementation, what happened was even when, you, if, even when the code was in the expired state, one of the functions, which is called uh, update executors, was actually able to change some global properties. And in particular, the properties were the delay and the grace period. And so these are actually really important properties which actually affect whether another transition can happen or not. And so what happened was that even after the, 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 the code was at, in the expired state, the update executor method could execute and change these uh, global properties. And as a result of that, the, the contract would again go back into a queued state, which is not allowed, right? Like that's, that's violating the property that is uh, marked in, the, uh, in red over there. And so what, uh, and what was even further uh, interesting for us is that at the time, actually, there wasn't any test, even in the Foundry test set, in Aave that could catch this bug. OK, so we were like, OK, that's fine. Uh, why don't we actually write a test that can catch this bug? So how would you write such a test? So let's, uh, let's try to take a look at uh, uh, you know, a simple test that will catch this. So uh, I'm kind of lying to you here a little bit, and you'll see just a second why. Uh, because uh, most of the work here, uh, so here, okay, so the name of the test is uh, this big thing, you know, test no transition beyond state three. And then at the end, I said execute payload because I'm just running, I'm just implementing this test for one of the functions. And execute payload is one of the functionality that exists in the Aave code. Okay, so what is happening in this code? Uh, so first of all, we are calling this function called setup executed. And setup executed is basically doing everything, right? So the reason this test is so small is because all the stuff is happening in setup executed. And then basically the rest of the test is saying that once the execute payload method has been executed, if you try to do, if you try to execute that method again, it should revert. So what exactly is this uh, setup executed method doing? It doesn't actually matter. Uh, what matters is what I've highlighted here, right? So all this is saying is, OK, we are going to execute payload. So that's the first line in that red box. And it's just returning the ID of the payload. And also, it's returning the payload controller, which is used to call the function. So these are the two things that it's returning. And we are using it to basically uh, you know, uh, invoke the execute payload method again on top. OK, so this is fine. You know, this is a test that you know, seems to be reasonable. And uh, there's nothing wrong with this. The problem, however, is that this test is only checking this property for the execute payload method. Now, for this property to hold, you actually have to write such a test, or maybe you have to write an invariant that checks a property for all the, all the methods that are in the, in the contract. But this is just for one of them. The other issue is that we are only checking this when the contract is in the executed state. But it could also be in the created state. It could be in the expired state. It could be in the compile, uh, sorry, cancel state. So you know, we need to figure out what to write, you know, how to write tests for all of those different states. Okay, so that kind of makes this a little bit tedious, right? So um, you know, if you if you have to sit down and write and uh, you know, think about all the different combinations of the different uh, you know uh, variables and come up with a test for each of those, you can imagine that your life is not going to be great, right? Like, you are inevitably going to miss some corner case, and uh, you are not going to have a foolproof uh, you know, guarantee that this bug is not going to be there. Um, and one other thing also is, this is all, th you know, these three problems that I've listed here are not all the problems. Like, this is not even looking at the different transactions that can happen. It's not even checking all the values of the different global variables. So this is only, you know, it's a very small, uh, it's a narrow view of the problem here. Um, but that said, you know, this test is a valid test, and it would be, uh, you know, it would catch the problem, but only in, uh, if the problem manifested in this particular function and in this particular state. OK, so now what can we do? So if testing isn't really going to be the best approach to uh, find these kinds of bugs, what can we do? So here I have a property in uh, the CVL language. So CVL is the Certora verification language. It's a declarative uh, language where you can uh, specify properties about your program. So this is actually doing the exact same thing that we saw in the previous slide, but it's a little bit more generic than that. So what is happening? So first we have um, the name of this property. So 
the name here is no transition beyond state greater than three. And uh, the rest of the stuff is not super relevant. The main important thing here is that we are storing the state before any transaction happens or any function call happens in this variable called state before. And we are just calling get payload state to get that information. Then we are calling some function f. Now, what is f? No one knows, right? Because this is, uh, this is where actually the, prover, uh, the, the search for verification language uh, shines. So this is what we call a parametric property. And f can be anything that is in your contract. So this is basically going to be checked for all the functions that exist in your smart contract. Uh, one thing that you can maybe notice already is we did have a filter. So in this case, we have a filter that says that we only care about the functions that are not view functions. And if you, if you take that filter away, then it will truly check it for all the different uh, functions that are in your code. And then once we have executed some function f, uh, we again get the state by again calling the get, pay, uh, get payload method. And finally, we have an assertion. And the assertion just says that if state before is greater than 3, then state before should be the same as state after. So this is the property. And you know this is a pretty simple looking property, right? But it is actually doing something really complex. So it's a very rich property, even though it looks very simple. And it will catch, it will basically check the, this, uh, this invariant that uh, Ave wanted for all possible functions and all possible states and all possible uh, values of the global variables and so on. So this is, um, this is how you would write a property in CVL that would uh, express that uh, specification. So uh, you can check out, actually, the execution of the, this property in the prover if you, if you click, uh, click on the QR code. And it'll take you to the, the reports page. And you can uh, figure out, you know, you can, you can see what the result looks like. OK, so if you do actually check it, check it out, you will notice that there is a red cross next to the, this property. And the red cross is basically telling you that there is a counterexample. And uh, later on in this talk, I'm going to actually go through that, that counterexample. And you'll see that it's actually not very subtle. Uh, sorry, it is actually very subtle. So it's not very obvious uh, how you would actually like, hit this when you're, if you're just doing fu uh, fuzzing or testing and stuff like that. OK, so what now? Uh, so clearly, there was an issue. And the prover found the issue. But it turned out that the fix was actually very simple. So this is a really nice scenario, right? So in, uh, in this case, again, here's a QR code. You can uh, click on the QR code and see the rest of the diff where Ave actually fixed the issue. Uh, so basically, uh, what we, the change was that instead of referring to some uh, global uh, you know, state, just access the local, uh, local um, uh, variables. And so this basically fixed the problem. And the code was, uh, you know, everything was fine. The code is now correct, and it's deployed, and everybody's happy. OK, so like, the, the key takeaway here is that with uh, uh, you know, something like a formal verification, uh, you can actually do really, you can prove really interesting properties about your program, which can be done with other techniques, but it's often much harder. And sometimes you simply can't do it. So you get much stronger guarantees. And in this case, you know, the property isn't even that complicated, right? So it's a very simple looking property. It fits in one slide, but it's checking something very interesting and complex about your code. OK, so this was just an example of uh, you know, a property for a real contract that I thought would be interesting for people to see. But now for the rest of the talk, I want to actually uh, tell you how exactly is the prover checking these kinds of properties? So what exactly is happening inside the search for a prover when you write a property like this and you run the prover and you get this like fancy looking uh, you know, report page? OK, so that's the rest of the talk. Um, so at, at a very high level, we have this search for a prover in the middle. And it takes two things as input. It takes code written in Solidity, or you know, it could be in Viper. It could be, uh, now we also have support for Solana. So it could be C. Um, and also, you have a specification. And the specification is what we saw right now, right? So we just saw an example of a specification in CVL. So both of those things get, uh, go into the prover. And the prover in, uh, you know, either tells you that there is a violation, or it tells you that the code actually satisfies the specification. So you feel, you, know, you feel confident that your code is correct. Now, of course, 
Um, this, you know, there is a caveat here. So the specification here is the ground truth, right? So the code will only be, you know, checked against whatever you write in the spec. So if you get the spec wrong somehow, uh, wrong here is kind of in a double quotes, right? Scare quotes, I guess, because, you know, what does it even mean for the spec to be wrong? Well, maybe you have a logical error in your, uh, in your encoding or something like that. But basically the point is that your code is always checked against a spec. So the code will have the same guarantees that you are expressing in the specification. So it'll be as correct as the spec, basically. Okay, so taking a closer look at the prover itself, uh, the way the prover is doing this at a, you know, like a little bit of a lower level is it's, uh, you know, it's taking your code, it's taking your spec, and it's converting that into a logical formula. And this logical formula is then sent to uh, off-the-shelf solvers, and these solvers are actually solving for the satisfiability of the formula. And the, uh, like this, when I say solver, uh, I mean you know, things like, uh, maybe you've heard about you know, SAT solvers or like Boolean satisfiability. Uh, so those are you know, solvers that basically can solve for, you know, if you have a Boolean formula or something, uh, it can tell you whether the Boolean formula can be satisfied. So we use some uh, solvers that are a little bit more uh, sophisticated than just plain uh, Boolean satisfiability solvers. So these solvers are called SMT solvers. And what's nice about SMT solvers is you are not just constrained to solving uh, you know, for just Booleans, for example, right? So you can have a uh, you know, logical formula that involves linear arithmetic, real arithmetic, nonlinear arithmetic, and all of these fancy things, and the solvers are very good at handling them. OK, so what exactly is happening in that blue Sertora box? Um, so essentially what we have is uh, this language CVL that we saw in the, uh, earlier in the talk. And what CVL is doing is it, you can think of it as a wrapper, right? So you have your code that you wrote in Solidity. And in CVL, what you can do is basically write pre and post conditions and you know, other you know, requires and all of these things that surround a function call that you know, the function exists in your Solidity program. So you can imagine that the CVL uh, you know, is, a, is a language that basically lets you wrap your function calls with pre and post conditions. OK, so that's one of the things that the prover does. Another thing that the prover does is it takes your really complex program in Solidity, and it breaks it down into simpler operations. Now, this doesn't actually mean that the program is semantically different. It's still semantically the same program, but it's expressed in a different representation. And this representation is, uh, is, is easier to reason about, even though it's actually capturing the same program we started with. OK, and then uh, another thing that the prover does is before we actually generate these logical formula and let's send it to the solvers and all of this stuff, we actually try to simplify the program by doing various meaning-preserving simplifications to the code. And I'm going to show you a very simple example of one such uh, simplification later in the talk. OK. So that was still kind of high level. Now, if you take an even closer look, things start to look a little bit more complex. So this is kind of the high level, high level, low level, if you will, uh, workflow of the tool. And uh, I'm going to walk through this and show you exactly what, it, what happens in uh, each of the different components of this workflow. But to do that, I'm going to first actually give you an example of a simpler contract, because uh, the Aave one that we saw, I mean, obviously, it's a very sophisticated piece of code, and I don't think we have uh, you know, time to go over like something that complex. So here we have a very simple contract, which is just called bank. And uh, what, what's happening in this contract is we have some uh, mapping called funds. And we have these simple methods, right? Like we have a method called deposit. It uh, takes some amount. It adds it to the fund. We have another method called get funds. It uh, takes an account, and it looks up the funds in the account and returns them. So it's a very simple uh, contract. OK. So now, an interesting property for this contract that you might be interested in checking is how do we know that this deposit method actually increases the funds by this amount um, that is the argument, right? So this is a property that this function should satisfy, and you might be interested in verifying this about this contract. So how will the prover help us do that? OK, so the first thing the prover will do is so the, the code was in Solidity, right? So the, uh, the Sertra prover doesn't actually work at the Solidity level. So the first thing we do is we compile the, the Solidity code using Solidity compilers. Like, you know, we support uh, a wide range of versions of the Solidity compiler. And we basically generate EVM bytecode from the Solidity code using these off-the-shelf compilers. 
So there are actually some nice benefits to working at the bytecode level. Uh, one of the benefits is we don't actually have to trust the compiler. And in fact, we have found several bugs in the Solidity compilers just because we actually work at the bytecode level. Another advantage is that it makes it relatively easier to support other EVM-based uh, EVM languages. So for example, we have now support for Viper. And uh, because we were working at the bytecode level, we didn't have to just then go and implement another search approver just for Vi Viper, right? So a lot of the infrastructure were just, just completely reusable uh, because we work at the bytecode level. Of course, there was, it was not completely smooth. Like, we did have to change things uh, so that we could satisfy, you know, uh, some Viper-specific things, but most of the components of the tool were pretty uh, usable, reusable, just because of this uh, design decision. Okay, so now we have EVM bytecode, um, and here are actually, uh, by the way, some of the examples of uh, some of those compiler bugs I was mentioning. So you can check these out uh, on our uh, the Certera blog posts. Uh, th there's a series of blogs that we have posted that describe exactly what these bugs are, and uh, you can you know feel free to take a look at them. OK, so now we, are ha we have bytecode. Great. So if you have ever seen EVM bytecode, you will know that the bytecode is actually a stack machine, right? So uh, the bytecode basically looks like there's push, pop, and like a bunch of other like load and store and all of these instructions. And it's implemented as a stack machine. So the prover doesn't actually work at the bytecode level either. So what we do is uh, we go from the bytecode into our own intermediate representation, which we call TAC. So TAC stands for three address code. Uh, three address code is actually a pretty standard uh, way of representing low-level uh, instructions, low-level programs. Um, the nice thing about uh, TAC is that the instructions themselves are very simple. So every instruction does one operation only, right? So maybe if you are you know, loading from memory, then that's a separate instruction. Uh, there are instructions for the different, you know, mathematical operations like plus, minus, and so on and so forth. But, you know, the program itself is much simpler uh, at the TAC level. And it, you know, but of course it means that it's a little bit uh, harder to read the TAC, but it's still a lot simpler and therefore also easier to verify. Okay, so another thing about TAC is uh, there's a small number of instructions, but these instructions are pretty expressive. So any program in Solidity, we are able to compile into TAC. So TAC has everything you need to represent a complex program in Solidity. OK, so here's an example. Uh, I don't actually expect you to read this code, but just to give you an, uh, an idea of how you know, messy this TAC can sometimes look. So here we have the Solidity code for the bank, and then we have on the side the TAC, right? So again, you know, it's big, but it's simple, right? So it's easier for an automated tool to work with. So that's really the reason why we uh, uh, do this, you know, why we work at the TAC level. Okay, so now we have gone from high-level solidity to low-level uh, TAC. So what do we do now? So it turns out that even at the TAC level, there are still things in the code that might be useful to just not have, right? So, for example, uh, the different TAC instructions can have very subtle dependencies. And we want to make sure that we have a way to know what those dependencies are. And if there aren't any, we also want to know that. So one of the things we do at the stack level is we do, like, an we analyze the TAC, right? So we have a bunch of different static analyses that we have implemented. And they just learn a bunch of different facts about the TAC at different program points. So for example, one of the things that we learn is uh, something called the points to relation. So we want to know, uh, you know, if you have a different, uh, you know, um, accesses to the memory, we want to know if those accesses are ever going to be aliased or not. And this is information that is actually really useful to know. Because if we know this information beforehand, before we, you know, go to the solvers, then we can actually simplify the code and make the life of the solvers much easier. So just to give you a very high level example of what this uh, looks like. So here I have uh, a very small code snippet. So we have a struct x and a struct y. They're both my struct. And they have a field f, right? And so the, uh, for x, f's value is 1. And for y, f's value is 2. Now we have an instruction that writes uh, to y.f, the value 3. And then we have an assertion, so that's a property, let's say, that we want to check, right? So we want to say, assert x.f is always 1. 
So one of the things that we, you can get from doing this kind of static analysis at the tag level is you can realize that the y dot f equals to 3 does not affect x at all. So you can actually simplify the code and get rid of those two, uh, you know, uh, the, the assignment, and basically just have the assertion simply on x dot f. Okay? So this is just a very high-level example of uh, some simplifications you can do by analyzing the tag. Okay, so now we have started, okay, so we started at the solidity level, we generated the CVM bytecode, then we generated tag, we simplified the tag, but we still don't have, you know, uh, we don't have the final logical formula that I was, I was telling you in the beginning that we sent to the solver. So how do we go from this code to this logical formula? So now we're gonna understand that. And this is where you can see that the specification also comes in. So just to give you a, a very quick overview of the underlying principle that we use to uh, convert the, 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 the TAC program into this logical formula, I'm gonna do a very, very quick you know, aside, if you will, on uh, this um, you know, a, a, a technique or like a, you know, a, a, a method, I guess, uh, called Hoare logic. So Tony Hoare is a very, very famous uh, computer scientist. He pioneered a lot of formal verification work uh, many, many, many years ago, and this is uh, named after him. So when you write pre and post conditions in your program, those are actually called Hoare triples. So what is this saying? This is saying that you have some property P, and you have some property Q, and you have some code S. So the way you read this is if P holds, before you execute S, then Q must hold after executing S, okay? So you can see that, you know, when you write assertions in your code, this is kind of what, you know, what you're doing, right? So you're saying like, you know, if you have this uh, assumption in the beginning, then you execute the code, then I want this assertion to be true at the end. Okay, so this is one thing that we need to know. So uh, the, the, the underlying technique that the prover, uh, et cetera, uses is based on this idea of whole logic. The second concept that we need to know is what is called weakest precondition. And uh, the idea here is that our goal, okay, so our initial goal is to prove that whole triple, right? So we want to say that, can you prove to me that if P holds and I run S, then Q will be true at the end? So that's our goal. But how do we actually do that? The way we do that is by using this tool, this technique called weakest precondition. So what is the weakest precondition? Uh, it's a predicate, uh, it's a weakest predicate, in fact, such that when you uh, execute the program S, Q will be true in the end. And so the weakest precondition is, is, by, con is, is, is by design the weakest property that has to be true at the top of a program, such that when the program is done, at the bottom you have the, uh, the, you know, the final uh, post condition uh, holds. Okay, so now we have learned about weakest precondition. This is the fastest way I could, you know, somebody can probably uh, show you what this is, but, uh, you know, there are, uh, like, class courses that go on for, like, months and months to actually understand how, uh, how to actually, you know, uh, generate these weakest preconditions, how to prove these kinds of things, and so on. So this is a very, very high-level overview of, uh, of these kinds of techniques. Okay, so you generate the weakest precondition, and now, remember, our goal was to prove PSQ. Right? Our goal is not, you know, the weakest precondition is just the, a step that we need to take in order to prove that property. So now once you have generated the weakest precondition, in order to prove the original whole triple, all you need to do is show that your precondition P implies the weakest precondition WP. So if you are able to prove this, then you have actually proved your whole triple. And so this is the fundamental problem, like the, the, the principle that the search prover uses under the hood. Okay, so how do we, so now the question is, how do we actually get to this logical formula? So this, I hope I don't have to uh, convince you, is a logical formula. So remember in the beginning I, I said that in the prover, we take code and we take a spec and we convert that to a logical formula. This is a logical formula, but we still have a missing piece. We don't actually know how to get to this uh, you know, how do we get to this, like, the predicates themselves? And the answer to that is the specification. So P and Q come from the spec that you write, and in, in case of Sartora, it's in the CVL language. Okay, 
So that's why we had this, uh, you know, the, the spec is also one of the inputs to the VC generator. VC, by the way, just stands for verification condition. It's the, it's the logical formula that I, uh, we have been talking about this whole time. OK, so going back to our example, so remember we said that one property that we might, might want to check is whether deposit increases funds by amount. So the first step we need to take is we need to somehow write this property in something that's not just English, right? So we need to write it a little bit more formally. So for the Aave example in the beginning, you saw how we wrote the property that, you know, no transition can happen past state three using that simple CVL property. So now we're going to do the same thing for this property. So here we have a rule. Uh, the rule name is deposit OK. And it takes some amount. And uh, it also sets up some environment. So NVE is basically setting up some, uh, you know, some uh, like the EVM level, uh, like, a, a, like symbolically, it's setting up some uh, variable. So for example, with, uh, with E, you can access the message sender. You can access the timestamp and all those kinds of things. OK. So then uh, what we do is we say, you know, get the funds of the message sender before you call anything and put it in depo before deposit. And in this case, we're just calling deposit. So this is actually an even simpler rule, right? In this rule, it's not even parametric, right? We're just checking the deposit method. So we just call the deposit method. And the deposit method comes from the code, right? So that's from the, the contract. And then we again get the funds after deposit method has been called. And finally, we have this assertion that after deposit should be before deposit plus amount. This is the property that we care about, and we have written it. And now, if you want to tie it back to the, the weakest precondition stuff and the pre- and post-condition stuff that I was talking about, this is the, uh, the post-condition, right? So the, the code is deposit, right? So deposit here is S. Uh, the post-condition Q is, is this assertion. And in this case, we don't actually have a precondition. So it's just, you know, you can imagine that the precondition is just true, right? But you could have more complex preconditions uh, in, in, in other examples. Okay, so the key thing here is, you know, uh, this property, when you actually check this property with the prover, it guarantees that it's going to hold for all possible values of amount. And this also is kind of going back to the Aave example in the beginning. You know, you could have written the test that I showed you, but it wouldn't be checking it for all possible values of, uh, you know, the different states and different functions and so on and so forth. Great. So now we have taken our uh, Solidity program in the beginning. We did a bunch of stuff. We got to TAC. We took our spec. We put it in the VC generator. We got this property P implies WP. And now all we need to do is ship it to an SMT solver. So to do that, we, uh, so the SMT solvers are you know, off-the-shelf solvers. These have been developed by incredibly smart people for many, many years. And they are extremely good at doing what they do. So all we do is we generate the property, the, the, the logical formula. We give it to the solver. The solver comes back and tells us either the property is satisfiable or it's not. And for some complex reasons, we actually want the property to be not satisfiable. So you know, uh, if, the, if there is no satisfiable uh, assignments of the property, that means we're good. Like code matches spec, we are all happy. If not, that's when the prover will give you a counterexample. So basically, it's a concrete instance where you can see the violation. So then, you know, it's, the, our job is actually not done yet, right? So once we have gotten this counterexample, there is a whole additional amount of work we need to do to actually show the user what the counterexample is. And this is actually a really hard thing to do. Because a lot of the times, uh, you know, the, 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 the solver can it'll just give you a counterexample, right? The solver doesn't have any context about what the Solidity code was, you know, what is crypto, what is DeFi. It doesn't know anything. So it'll just give you some, you know, concrete assignments, and you need to figure out what that is. OK, so that's why, you know, uh, so we have, a, you know, a whole kind of a post-processing step where we take the uh, results from the solver, and we try to interpret that and present it to the user. So here is the page uh, that you, you can check it out at that QR code. But this is uh, the page uh, that the certify prover will generate for you uh, for the Aave example that we saw in the beginning. So recall that this was the property uh, that, we, uh, that we checked. And um, on the right, uh, sorry, on the left, uh, you can basically see that 
the no transition beyond state greater than three has some violations, right? So in fact, it's validated in a few functions. So the initialize function violates it, the update executor function violates it, and so on and so forth. So you can basically then click on the different uh, violated functions and see the counterexample. And OK, so now one interesting thing here is you see that the property no transition beyond state greater than three has all these, we check the property for all those different functions. And the reason that happened is because the, the property that we had written was actually parametric. We didn't actually say what method f is, right? So the prover figured out that, OK, I mean, I don't know what f is, so I'm going to check this property for all the f's that are in the function, in, in, the, um, in the contract. So that's why we have you know, all this kind of a drop down, and we can see the, the, st the status of the property for each of these uh, functions. So if you are, you know, a few other things I also want to show from that, uh, the link. Um, so if you actually look at the counter example, uh, it's actually, it, it will tell you exactly what happened, right? So it will tell you that I found a situation where this property was violated. And I, I know what, what happened is that state before was expired and state after was queued. And so that is the thing, you know, that the property initially said that it should never happen, but I, show, I found a situation where this happened. And if you look even closer, you will actually see what the different values are of the global variables and so on, and that will give you an idea of why exactly the contract breached this state at all. And in this case, uh, it, not that it really matters uh, for this talk, but you know, the specific inputs where the violation uh, was uh, witnessed are basically the delay the value of delay and the value of grace period. So those are the things that the contract was able to change, even though it should not have changed them after a certain uh, state. OK, so uh, that's pretty much all I actually had to say about uh, the search for prover. Uh, so hopefully, it gave you some idea of uh, you know, what the prover does and what kinds of things it's good at doing. So I'll just summarize the key takeaways from the, uh, the talk. So first, we saw why DeFi is a really good domain for formal verification. Hopefully, you're convinced that that's the case. Uh, then we saw a concrete example of a real protocol where writing a test for a, a seemingly simple property was actually not that easy. Uh, then we wrote a CVL property using, um, yeah, we wrote a CVL property to express the same, uh, same uh, you know, specification. Then we actually ran the prover. And we found a violation of the property. And then we also looked at how the prover actually works to find these kinds of violations. OK, so what does that actually mean? So in the, the, the title of my talk was kind of you know, uh, weird. Right? I was like, beyond testing or something like that. Why did I actually say, uh, choose that as my title? Because really, the point I was trying to make here is that you know, I, like, there are situations where testing is all you need to do. But there are properties where testing is just not sufficient, right? So you could probably make this argument that, well, I mean, you know, I can write a test that will catch that bug. And the answer is yes, you can. But only because I told you what the bug is. Now that you know that there is a bug, and now that you see some of the counterexamples, you can very easily convert the counterexample to a test. And you can run, uh, run the test, and the bug will be caught. But what's really hard and this is where uh, formal verification actually shines, is knowing what the test input should be beforehand. Right? If I didn't show you the counterexample, it would be hard for you to actually come up with that counterexample, because it's a little subtle. right? Like It's not obvious exactly what the different values should be. And um, you, know, you can probably do something like fuzzing, but it's, it's unlikely that a fuzzer will actually hit that kind of input. And if it, even if it does, it's probably going to take ma uh, very many you know, inputs to actually find, find those. OK, so and the final thing is uh, these are scenarios where something like formal verification is helpful, because it, if you're using formal verification, you don't have to worry about whether you hit all the interesting points or not, because formal verification actually will check all the possible states, all the possible inputs, and it kind of eliminates that kind of uh, worry from you. So that was a, that was the talk. Uh, again, like uh, Rajiv was mentioning before, uh, we do have a workshop where you can actually use the prover and you can check it out, uh, you know, firsthand with uh, some of our uh, team members. Johannes and Armin specifically are going to lead that. I highly encourage you to go and check it out. 
you can actually even run the prover and have access to it and uh, write some interesting properties. So thank you very much.